Okay, great. Um, getting started here, David Zerlin, associate partner at ESA Partners. Um, David's an associate partner, and, and he's led uh, user experience architecture group since 2001. Uh, he advises clients such as P&G, GE, Thompson Reuters, Caterpillar, the AMA, and IBM. Lots of uh, letters in those numbers. Uh, and effective Rock strategies yeah, for uh, meaningful user engagement within their ever-broadening digital ecosystem. Uh, prior to VSA, David was co-founder of the experience design firm, design firm Explore, and chair of interactive media for the University Film and Video Association. David's circuitous college career began with three years of architecture and involved building at uh, Washington University and ended with an MFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, where he is a sometime instructor. Uh, he's going to walk through a very interesting case study. Um, so, uh, round of applause for David Jones. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to let you soak that in for a second. This is a picture of a sheepish looking man um, holding a crushed box that says Fragile on the side of it. Uh, across from a distinctly unhappy looking woman. Um, she's also holding the box. What if I were to tell you that this is the face of this guy's next most loyal customer? A few years ago, I read an article by three McKinsey strategists. Uh, they called this a moment of truth. Um, the article was more about um, customer engagement and customer service, but it applies to us, I believe. Um, in a moment like this, um, when the natural flow of a customer experience is disrupted, the customer is deeply engaged, and their emotional outcome is almost always polar, either extremely negative or extremely positive. Um, it all depends on what this fellow does next. Uh, as experienced designers, we strive, we yearn for this level of engagement, but we're, uh, we're hoping more for the positive side of things. Uh, and um, so these two are having a moment of truth. How many of you have been in a situation akin to this, either online or offline? Show of hands. I know I've been. I've had some recent ones. And uh, I would suspect that you, like me, were pretty completely engaged. You were very focused and um, we were expecting a negative outcome. So uh, what has this got to do with 404 pages? When someone gets a 404 page, they're having an experience similar to this young lady. Their flow is disrupted, um, expectations are unmet, you're responsible, and they're looking to you for redress. So what happens next is that that deep engagement level is either going to be highly negative or highly positive. So this is a story of how we addressed IBM.com's 404 page in that context. Um, and laid the groundwork for a series of improvements to make the experience positive or happy. Our client, who was really our design partner in this case, uh, recognized the opportunity to improve the user's experience of the page and come out with something, uh, something positive instead of the polar opposite. Uh, we worked closely with him over a period of eight weeks to find True North and launch the very first um, iteration of the page, which uh, went live just a few days ago. Does everyone know what a 404 page is before I begin? So it's, uh, for in case you don't, it's the it's the page a web server displays if uh, it doesn't know, if you can't find the page that you're looking for and click on or in navigation or search for or whatever. Um, it doesn't know what to do and it throws up a page like this. So this is the current one today. Uh, it says, our apologies, the page you request can't be displayed. Um, it gives you some suggested actions, um, some other things that you can do. And uh, we came up with a system for evaluating, um, which we'll compare to that page. So, so this is going to be more or less a linear review of the highlights of our journey through uh, getting that, that, uh, that, that redesign page in about eight weeks. Uh, we started uh, with some research activities. We did some design explorations, and then uh, based on some testing, we uh, refined and built a page. Um, so uh, in the research side of things, we did a landscape review, where we found many examples of interesting or entertaining 404 pages, but few that were actually that helpful. We began with a spin through a slew of 404 pages, just to see what was out there and capture some general impressions. 
uh, we look at corporate sites, retail sites, media, technology sites, just to get a sense of the landscape and uh, form some, some opinions and impressions. Including this one, uh, Mint, um, which says, we looked everywhere and couldn't find that page, but we did find these under your couch, under the couch cushion. So, you know, things that you might find under your you know, jeans, I guess. Um, so we thought that was sort of cute. And then there's, there's a few links below that, I, that maybe aren't super helpful. So, um, so, you know, some rough impressions on what was, what Mint was doing. We looked at GitHub. GitHub is, um, is a developer focused site. So, um, that's, I don't know if you can tell, this is a sort of OUR, an old address character. I'm not saying this is not the picture that you are looking for. I don't know, it's either you know, Tatooine. And um, it's also got a search bar um, kind of right here in the middle of the page, which is pretty helpful for GitHub given, considering what it is. And, um, so, you know, a few appropriate, some general impressions about, about that site. Dilbert. Uh, which shows a, uh, a comic book, a comic strip about 404. Um, you know, what am I, what, am, how, what does it mean? Means the internet is full. How do I fix that? And then it shows the kind of trying to drip the plug into the, into the garbage. Um, so this was sort of interesting. Uh, reminded us that you can actually communicate in a branded sort of way. And uh, that it's probably a good idea to, to tell people what you can do next and then get this way it's out. Um, there is some navigation on the top of that page, um, but here on Nike.com, their corporate site, uh, there is no navigation. This is 100% of the page. Uh, it says 404 error and tells you a bit about um, how that came about, and then um, it does the same thing in about 10 other languages. Simple, minimal, um, all unhelpfully multilingual. Uh, could make some more intelligent choices, right? You could. Um, you can maybe pick the language that your browser was installed in and just show that. Uh, anyway, there's things that could, in you know, lots of ways, you could go about um, expressing that idea. And then there's really two links. Um, where to go next? You're probably going to hit the back button or just close the window or something else. Go play with children. So, um, after familiarizing ourselves, we looked at those and a bunch more um, and kind of distilled a set of general principles out of, um, out of what we saw. Those being that uh, a 404 page should convey to users that something went wrong, briefly indicate why, and give users some obvious options for getting back on track. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Um, and uh, maybe familiar to those of you who are familiar with Jacob Nielsen back in 1995 when the web was becoming an FD and he said, help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from error. Error messages should be expressed in plain language. Precisely uh, indicate the problem. Um, we kind of put to that. Being precise about it probably is less important than brief about it, and constructively suggest the solution. Um, we eventually modified that a little bit too. So, taking those principles, looking at a couple more um, 404 pages, here's DB's um, main site, which with a mission not unlike IBM.com. File not found. Um, we apologize that the document you requested cannot be found. And then, so it conveys that something went wrong. It briefly indicates why. And then provides a scattering of options uh, for where you can go next. Um, although it's they're sort of confusing and organized, uh, not easy to follow. My favorite thing you can do here is, um, is you can share this page on social media. <laughs> Here's Oracle. This again is 100% of the 404 page. Super simple, which we can appreciate, right? But um, not all that helpful. It's um, it's conveying that something went wrong in a pretty obvious way. It's a pretty red stripe with an exclamation point on it. Um, it's can, it's um, indicating why something went wrong um, briefly, and giving you some uh, some links, which aren't necessarily obvious. Um, I mean, they're obvious for sure, but they're not that helpful. You have to go back and pretty much do anything here. You could have included some of that here, or maybe even made them unnecessary if the, the site's navigation were present. Anyone use MailChimp? 
So uh, this is this is the Mailchimp 404 page, which uh, which everyone on the team liked a lot. Uh, in fact, if, if we um, the the sort of more IA oriented people and me were uh, weren't really paying close close attention to this page so much, um, but it tickled everybody else so much that uh, we had to take a closer look at it. So it is, in fact, conveying that something went wrong. But thinking about how it did that, and, uh, and thinking back to Oracle, too. Hmm. Oh, look, a new version of Java is again. <laughs> I'm going to remind you later. <laughs> It does. Um, it does convey. Does convey that something went wrong. But in thinking about that, um, one of the things, one of the most obvious ways it's conveying that something went wrong is in the format of the page itself and what it's doing. So this is so unlike any other page on on the web that when you hit a page like this, you're like, hmm, this ain't right. And you haven't even read anything yet, right? So that felt like uh, a really good way to viscerally communicate that something's wrong. But it's take it's. Doing it in a somewhat joyful way, so it's not. Um, it's uh, it's indicating why. And the way it's doing that is actually pretty interesting. Um, it's kind of hard to see on the projection, but it's feeding back to you a bit the uh, the URL that you requested, thinking that that might be helpful. And in some cases, it probably is. Um, it couldn't find. It's not that it couldn't find the page you were looking for. It's it couldn't find this page you were looking. And it's giving you some uh, some obvious ways out, including that search bar, which may or may not be that useful in Mail Mailchimp's case, but it's uh, it's giving you an option. Maybe it didn't score so high in this department. So this this page pivoted our thinking a little bit. It has a lot of character, and the way it's having fun seems right on brand for Mailchimp, and it doesn't get in the way of the things that it has to do with 404. So um, we, uh, after paying some closer attention, we actually decided. I mean, I I think this, you know, the designer's visual, vis visceral reaction to the page had uh, a lot going for it. Another page that drew our attention, and this isn't um, even technically a 404 page. It's a, uh, it's, uh, we looked at a few e-commerce sites actually to see how they dealt with requests they couldn't process. So this, um, let's analyze it a little bit here. So I searched for, I purposely misspelled high cost in the search. It's mistakenly uh, convert that to pip, but it fed that into the product search uh, search bar, uh, product search engine, and it produced a number of you know, real results that, if it had been right, would have been very useful. So that made us think um, that 404 pages should maybe be doing something similar. So based on that, we changed our uh, changed our principles um, a little bit. We made the users if something went wrong. Briefly indicate why and give users some options for getting back on track for the, the original three. So we tweak that a little bit to say give users some relevant options for getting, getting back on track and express the character of the brand in those first three bullets. And if you do that, you're probably um, you're probably doing a pretty good job of making people happy. So with those guidelines in mind, we needed a way to uh, gauge four or four page experiences. Um, the ones that we were about to design, but the ones that we just looked at, and the ones we looked at with each other. So we um, we created um, a little bit of a uh, of a measuring stick. So after some back and forth, we determined that there are basically two continuums or continua um, that we were that were important for this particular project. One was a function continuum, and another was a tonal. So the function spectrum has two endpoints, direction and diversion. So direction is whether the page proactively tries to get the user back on track. If it is, it's going up. And if it's trying to create a diversion for people on the side or around, then it's down here. And then a tone spectrum. The tone spectrum has technical and delightful. So it's, this is in how it conveys the information, the practical information. How how it conveys the information um, to the user. So if it's doing it in a very uh, functional, functional way, it's over here on technical. And if it's providing engagement to the brand, it takes the skin to the insights. So using that, 
um, that, that grid, let's look again at IBM.com's current 404, the one that was current then. So it's extremely prosaic, right? It's about as far to the left as you can go. It's trying to provide uh, direction rather than distract, so it's you know, maybe above the, the halfway mark a little bit. Um, within the main body area, there's several groupings that are a little hard to differentiate. And along with the main navigation, which includes search, and a large footer, there are potentially some helpful ways out. It's not a total failure or anything. Um, but um, it could provide better direct, a little bit more direction. So, um, so just like about here. Okay. 404 is similarly technical in tone. Uh, Oracle's 404, similarly technical in tone. It's, uh, it's a whole lot simpler, but without any navigation or search, it loses a little ground to IBM in terms of its helpful direction. Um, and what GE gains by having that main navigation around, it loses by being so chaotic. So we put it in the same place vertically as Oracle, and it's also kind of all the way to the left. Oh, there's a lot of stuff over there on the left. Um, and all set. But this is what, um, this, this is a, a scatter of the, the, um, the main uh, sites that we were tracking um, and how they plot it out. So um, make note of Zappos. The Zappos commerce uh, dot here where it's pretty, it's very helpful, it's directed. And this one here, Roman Fraser, who's a, a developer in France. Because they helped us uh, figure out a few things about this and other things that are uh, sort of important. Uh, one of these, one of the discoveries from uh, looking at this was that it's possible to go too far to the right. So if you're, for our brand anyway, too much delight and you cheapen the situation, you lose your brand. I don't think that's probably true for, for any brand. Um, remembering that people are here because um, their, their flow has been disrupted, um, you could easily get too delightful and piss them off. Um, this is, uh, and just to give you a show, a, a little taste of what's, what we thought was over the line. Uh, here we go. Uh, if I do this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, here, here is. The idea here is that you're um, you're trying to save the lemmings from their uh, <laughs> their fall to that uh, whatever that is a brick wall, um, and uh, you can save them. You can't save all 404 of them, but um, when it's the end, then you're kind of all right. Now I'm, I'm my flow is disrupted still, and you waste uh, you know, two minutes of my time. Um, although it was amusing, right? It was abstract. Uh, the other discovery uh, that we made looking at the Zappos e-commerce example was that some amount of personalization is actually required to make path uh, truly useful pathways off the page. So Zappos may not be the best example of that, but it hinted at what was possible. So this horizontal blue line um, represents personalization, and everything above it um, is providing intelligent and dynamic recommendations. So we figured that we're trying to target probably right about here with our design experience. So uh, then we did a little bit of traffic analysis um, as the last bit of research that we did. So this is what we were hoping for, and I'm just going to rattle through this. Um, site exits from 404 page. This, we figured, was the principal KPI, right? People are reading your site from the 404, then you're not making that 404 page good enough. You want to put them back in the flow. Uh, top countries to visit, uh, top countries of visitors to the page, and top languages of visitors to the page. We figured those were very rough indicators of user need that might help prioritize language variation. We didn't have access to the we didn't and don't still have access to the um, to the analytics tool, and uh, so we have to ask for um, for analytics, and this is just a list that we were asking for. So top refers to the page. This would be um, just shows how people got to the page. Refer is the site the user was on just before they came to your uh, to your your site. Um, shows how people got there, which is a more specific indicator of what users are looking for. And then uh, 404 visits uh, 
over total visits, which is the percentage of how serious, uh, of how um, how many visits are um, are four hundred fours, and then tells us how serious the problem four hundred four problem is. So here's what we can get. Um, top refers to the page. Uh, many, it turns out many users arrive at the 404 page via search engine results page, something like 40% is huge. Which leads to the question, why are there so many dead links in, uh, in, search, in the search indices? And that is a problem being solved by another a different parallel project that I know. And, um, and then um, we weren't able to get total, uh, total visits, we were able to look at page views. And in a four-week period, there are something like quarter of a million page views, four or four page views, compared to 64 million um, total page views on IBM.com. So that's like 0.35%, which is a lot. And then if you consider that a um, that a visit might consist of two and a half, maybe three page views per per visit, like one percent of visits include a four or four page there, which is terrible. So with that, we started um, with that under our belts and uh, feeling like we had researched a little bit, we were able to kind of get started to find. So I'm going to rattle through this and get to the three that we selected. But over um, over several couple of weeks, we developed several concepts using using those four principles as our guide. The writer uh, generated dozens of message variations, which visual designers and I. Um, we expand upon, and we bring our drafts to collaborative discussion for each session. This is just kind of giving you a taste of some of them. Um, and we discuss and redline them and revise for the next session. Um, and we, uh, all along the way, we're working closely with our, with our clients. This is a fun one. It's, uh, it says, nine, Watson is 96.64% confident that the Things you were looking for can't be found, um, which we would have explored more, except that um, at some point the, our client decided we should really just not not involve Watson unless we get Watson truly involved, which would slow us way down. So um, in a couple of weeks, we worked our way down to three-ish variations for testing, and that's what we're going to get right now. Concept one: we call it simple with a touch of whimsy. So that's an upside down uh, IBM logo. And uh, it's a little hard to see. There's a search box in here. Um, so it's pretty straightforward in this functionality, but it uses the, the upside down um, what's called the EPAR logo um, as a way to kind of add a little bit of the light. And uh, the page quickly informs users that uh, uh, of error that's encountered and provides search right there where you can't see it. Um, to, uh, to give an easy way off the page and alongside um, a number of top these each of these cards represents um, top pages. And those can be, depending on how intelligent they are, um, which we'll talk about a little, in a little bit, depending on how intelligent we can make these, we might be able to get you know, this version, this concept, a little bit above that blue line. But because of the uh, upside down eight bar, we're going to right around here in, uh, in the tonal spectrum. Concept two, expertise as a resource. So this concept recommends select IBMers along with targeted links to help people find what they need. This, this allows users access to um, a resource that's unique to IBM, the IBMer. So in this case, I'm just going to kind of Blast through it. Uh, it says the page we're looking for is missing, but we'd like to help you find what you need. And it offers a, uh, um, a drop down this box. Um, later, we, we knew at this stage that we actually needed to provide some results in there. People wouldn't bother with this. But uh, in this concept, ran like this. You select um, one of these six um, inscrutable options. Cloud, analytics, mobile, social, security, Watson. Um, this, um, these are called the market are called the market categories, and they didn't test very well. Um, people didn't know how to choose from between those. I think in the last the last talk we were in about people needing to be able to distinguish between the choices in order to make them otherwise they're nervous or uh, unhappy. 
uh, this made people unhappy. Let me test it. We'll get there in a second. Uh, but if you did, if you got through that, um, you'd be able to see some experts here and, uh, and some resources. Links to pages that are related to this page I just made. Scroll down the page a little bit. If you, uh, on the desktop, if you hover over the little circles and get an idea of who that person is, you can chat with them or email them right there. That's what the chat box looks like. Um, and so this one, we're figuring, we're figuring out if, if people actually ended up in communications with an IBMer, um, they'd be getting personalized direction, so it's kind of about that we want. And um, hopefully, it's a delightful conversation, and, uh, and they're somewhere along the uh, middle of the right side of the spectrum there. Um, that's a big if, though, um, and one that we test. If they ever even got to the point where they could talk to somebody. Concept three we call it intelligent search. And this is, uh, this is what it looked like. So in this case, a search field would be pre-populated with some search, search terms based on what we can interpret from the user's, um, the user's request. And again, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, with rec results cards below here um, that come from a carefully curated set of maybe 200 locations. So in this case, we're imagining that, um, that an editor is analyzing the, the use cases that produce a 404 page, looking at those refers, looking at those search terms, and trying to, trying to manually connect those, you know, month by month to a set of maybe 200, 300 locations on IBM.com. And then as you come to the site, you either you type or if you populate this, it's drawing from a small, like very curated set. So it has the potential to be very, um, very useful. So that we figured that was going to put you right up here above the blue line. Um, but in, in terms of um, tonality, it's kind of like more on the other side of the spectrum to be talked about. So we have one other concept, which is really um, a meta concept. So in this case, we're dynamically showing different, different modules, like the ones we were just looking at. Uh, so it doesn't have to be in, um, you know, either or of those three concepts. We could actually um, dynamically show one or the other based on what we can know about about users based on, on properties. So what? So, so we ask ourselves, what are some of those properties that we could actually know today with the technology that we have today? And it turns out we can know um, because many visitors to IBM.com, something in the order of one one percent, are um, are logged in or have logged in. We can know. And, and have a profile. We can know things like primarily, uh, you know, primary industry, company size, company preferred language, geographic location for those people. And we can know from user's IP address some of the same stuff based on a service that IBM just bought called the demand base. We can speed up the IP address and we can adapt a whole bunch of stuff like this. The recurring URL, the place to view the web before, if you look at that, we can know some new things. If we look at the requested URL, that broken link itself, you know, we can know a few things and we can look at the install and we can look at the and know some things. And based on those things, we can build some intelligence that will dynamically show the modules some of which we were just looking at. So what does that look like? If we, what does that intelligence look like? Well, for making, you, for, this is a simple flowchart flow chart that just shows the order in which we might test some things. So if the user is authenticated, we can get uh, their industry from their profile and show some so that you know, show some new cards based on that for module A. If we don't, if they're not authenticated, we can do the same kind of thing using the IP address and, and show that module. And we come back over here, and is there a cert query in their URL? And if it is, let's show some search results that we plug into IBM.com search. This is the parent parsable out of the uh, out of the URL, but uh, the referring URL, uh, the requested URL. And if it is, let's instead of taking them right there, to show them the teaser module. And if none of that's possible, we'll just show some arbitrary ones that you know, talk to us. So if we do something like that with some of those other concepts, we end up 
kind of right here where we were looking to go. So that seemed like it was a worthwhile pursuit. So before building and launching, um, we needed to uh, test some of these ideas with actual users. So we tested a prototype of the first three concepts, starting from a Google search results page, which are, was our principal uh, use case. And it was, I gotta say, it was super interesting to see people get disrupted. Because we didn't tell them they were gonna, we're testing a 404 page. We said, you're looking for uh, IBM digital asset management. So just start here at this Google search page and go, and I'll show you the, the prototype in a second. But when people hit that, hit that 404 page, they, it was, I don't think I've ever seen such disentanglement or entanglement on, the, on users' faces. It was astonishing, and it really made me think, that is that moment, uh, that is that, that moment of truth. They are like really trying to get their heads around what's going on, and it's fascinating. To watch. So, uh, but before I show you the prototype, the goals of the study were um, to investigate the flow from the most common user scenario, a broken link from the external search from an external search engine, so a, a Google search page, to see how people react overall to the message of the component right outside our logo, so on the inside. We need to investigate the various ways out that we would constructed for them to help them hopefully get them back on track. So let me uh, pop open the prototype real quick. Okay. So um back in sight. So this is a faked up Google search uh, search page, and if I type Google Asset, and then uh, search, this is a faked up search results page. If I click on it, bang. They're looking at the prototype of the, of the page itself. This is where everyone went, what? If you type in here, um, the results change a little bit. So that's one, that was uh, one concept. Again, IBM digital. What's that? Oh, well, won't matter, it's fake. <laughs> um, and you pick, a, pick your choice on an IBM site, and the idea was to pick the ones that were IBM related. And um, and here is uh, here's another variation which we didn't look at in that um, So this is um, this is what it looks like if your query is fed into IBM.com search engine and gives you some results. And then I'm just going to go on through this last one. Breaking it again. This is the experts uh, option. And um, this ended up not being uh, of much interest to people at all. People did not want to be talking to, to, to anybody. <laughs> they wanted to just get back in their flow. <laughs> They were, they were picturing it as a, as a web-only experience. And, um, but anyway, you can, uh, you can pick from among these, these choices. And we uh, showed some results before they actually had to interact with them. And there's a search bar right in here. So that's that. Overall findings were that um, uh, people were confused at first. It took a while for them to understand what was happening and why, like I explained. People were task-focused. Um, people understood that the page was trying to be informal and human with that with the message area. Um, but it was, it, and appreciated it, but it wasn't like they, they 
laughed or smiled or anything. Um, the upside down logo was just a cue, another cue. Another thing that was sort of interesting was that the, the words, the verbiage 404 error was, um, everyone thought it was redundant, but many people said that it actually contributed to their sense that something was wrong. So we left it in. So what did we do to improve it? We decided, uh, because, because the, the search, um, it turned out that seeing search results fed back and, uh, on their, uh, coming from a search page, if they see, if they're looking at search results on the 404 page, they thought that was just great. Like everyone pretty much agreed that if, if they're searching, that was the thing that they wanted to see. So we moved that, um, we moved, um, we moved that search choice up in the, in the, um, in those, uh, the logic of the of the uh, display, and we uh, we killed the parent teaser page, and uh, we ended up with this. But we decided that um, that all of the mapping to industry and, uh, and um, curating of spots on IBM.com was not something that we'd be able to set up the process for and execute on uh, by you know three weeks, four weeks from um, from when we designed. So um, so that got left. For the next phase. So then we build, and this is what's live today. It's on IBM.com today, right now. It's kind of exciting for us because it literally launches a couple days ago. And uh, the, the version of it that, uh, is, that we haven't yet figured out how to show or how to how to get to is um, what you see when you come from the search results page that has a bad link in it. But this is what, and this is what we ended up building and delivering. You just can't make it happen on IBM.com. So how do we do? Um, based on our subjective uh, analysis of using our, our little uh, our little grid, if we can't get the search query, users get a, ge a generic version, which is kind of like this here. Um, so that kind of leaves us. Um, the upside down logo inverted is somewhat cute, so it moves us over to the right. Um, and if, uh, if we can get a user's query, links off the page are personalized, so we can actually get above that to be long a little bit. And when we start doing more advanced interpreting of the requested URL, IP address and referring URL, we're actually going to be able to get from the above that to long. So I probably don't need to tell you guys this, but if you users from ever seeing a world page, that's the, that's the true goal, right? Unfortunately, like I was saying, we were, uh, there was another parallel project that was all about that. This is also uh, one, uh, one another, this aligns also with another one of the recent 1995 observations that uh, even better to get good error, uh, error messages, even better than getting good error messages is a terrible design that prevents a problem from ever occurring in the first place. I'm going to skip this one. So if you guys uh, are considering addressing your own 404 pages or ones for your client, um, this is a reasonable set of guidelines, we think. Two baby users with something went wrong. Briefly indicate why. Give you your obvious and relevant options for getting back on track. And discuss the character of your brand and core organization in, uh, in doing those other things. And if you do those things, uh, then hopefully users will be back in their flow, feeling supported, happy, and with a deeper appreciation of what you do with them. That's it.